in the, the billing for this event, I saw the, the piece that went out on WorkVivo and it said we would leave no stone unturned. And I just thought to myself, that's a lot of stones. <laughs> to um, and I know Brian is in charge, of, amongst other things, of the Stonebreakers Yard in Kilmainham. They just keep they just keep making more stone, it turns out. <laughs> so I, I don't think we can get through everything, but we will certainly be ambitious in what we want to get through. Uh, one of the great things of having Brian here, one of the things I think we can do today is to situate RCSI in a wider context, see ourselves as others might see us, as, as outsiders might see us. Uh, so many of the people I see sitting here have, uh, already have connections and may know some of the history or may know all of the history. Um, but to see it in a, in a broader context is always really, really interesting. So I'm going to start off by saying that I, and I don't think I even use this word in the book, but I see RCSI as an enlightenment institution. It absolutely comes out of that moment in the history of ideas where you are going out with the old, in with the new, you're following a sort of scientific revolution and you're thinking of new ways of doing things. And that's why the surgeons those those members of the Guild of Barber Surgeons who are interested in surgery want to break with the barbers. They want to put things in much more scientific footing, as they will have seen happening on the continent. And just new thinking, fresh thinking. Um, it, it is science coming to the fore. It's, it's no coincidence, I think, that the Royal Irish Academy, which is kind of the premier body for, for science and, and, and the humanities in Ireland, um, dates from 1785, just a year after uh, RCSI. So RCSI is very much an enlightenment institution. But my question to kick it off then is that if RCSI is an enlightenment institution because of when it starts, Kilmainham Jail is almost the same age as RCSI. Yeah, so the, uh, the jail doesn't open until 1796, but the foundation stone is laid in 1787, which is quite a long gestation, um, but uh, but it's kind of coming out of the same kind of interest in kind of science and a more scientific approach to the reform of prisoners. Um, and I think well, when I was reading your book, what I thought was really interesting is they both emerge out of a slightly uh, by then disreputable kind of medieval past. So jails had kind of developed in a slightly ad hoc basis. So the city jail, for example, in Dublin was in Newgate, um, coincidentally, also where the city jail was in, in London. So it was basically a fortified building in the city where prisoners could be held to await their punishment. So they kind of develop in this very ad hoc way. They're they're dirty, they're crime ridden, um, um, and they kind of ultimately are kind of failed institutions. And at, towards the end of the 18th century, they start to look again at saying, well, maybe prison could be something that in the same way that the surgeons are looking at reforming the body, um the prison in a way is looking at reforming the soul like how do you change uh or, or fix someone who has gone down the route of kind of crime and wrongdoing um so you get a lot of very kind of similar um uh themes coming through uh one of the things that's interesting is in building these new jails they want them to be clean and orderly places. So there is this the idea of kind of public hygiene is coming through, but they talk about prisons being places which will be free from kind of uh, physical contamination. So kind of disease because these older jails, the medieval jails have been kind of sources of disease within, uh, this, uh, within the community, but also they talk about kind of moral contagion and they talk about kind of uh, temptation and, and the corruption that happens to prisoners in these older jails in the same way that they talk about disease, that it spreads from older prisoners to uh, kind of younger first time offenders. Um, and they are trying to, I think, make prisons um, more sanitary, as, what? More, sanitary. more sanitary, both morally and uh, yeah. uh, and physically. And even if you look at the kind of the original front of Clemenum Jail, it's not kind of unlike any other enlightenment building like the RCSI um, around the country. It's it's built as an institution, as almost a hospital for the soul. Uh -huh. So a hospital for the soul. Um, the other thing you get on that, uh, and I think we'll come back to that idea of how disease spreads, yeah. because it's still a bit of a mystery yeah. in, in this era too, but um, with new thinking, you, you get uh, dangerous new ideas. And th th this is a revolutionary period as well as a, uh, a period of 
advancing science and advancing our scientific principles. So 1776, you get the uh, revolution in the United States. 1789, you get France to fall of the Bastille. 1798, there's a revolution here at home. RCSI is kind of in the, in the mix of that. And actually there are figures from RCSI's history in the mix of say 1798, because these people are free thinkers. You need to be a free thinker if you want to break away from the guild of barber surgeons. But that sort of free thinking applies to all aspects of life. And you think, well, maybe we don't have to run along confessional lines anymore. So it's really interesting that RCSI from the get-go is a completely non-secular institution, which very much chimes with the ideals of the United Irishman. It was Wolf Tone who spoke about uniting Catholic, Protestant and dissenter. Um, and so you get figures like uh, it's it's not really surprising that those who want to break away from the old ways are also implicated in the new political ferment. Now that doesn't sit too well exactly with uh, an institution, even if individuals are involved. But an institution is a bit wary. So there is a couple of troublesome characters in RCSI's history, as far as the, the sort of state is concerned. One is William Deese, who I introduced you to outside. He was the first professor of surgery. Um, He's implicated in 1798, and the, the story is that he takes his own life rather than be arrested. But the other really interesting figure is William Lawless, who was a professor of anatomy and physiology. Um, uh, he, he, wrote, he wrote books on the subject, but he was absolutely front and central within the United Irish Conspiracy. And he did a legger. He just, he just ran. Uh, he went to, to France and uh, RCSI struck him from the books. He had his me membership revoked. Um, but he also had, you know, of a story. So that, as far as I'm concerned, that's more or less where the William Lawless story ends, except, of course, in 1996, with the passage of time, RCSI kind of rethinks how, how fond they are of these revolutionary characters. And he actually gets reinstated and his tomb as, as, a, as a fellow of the college and his tomb gets restored uh, in Paris. He's buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery. But, you know, other aspects of the William Lawless story that were unfamiliar to me. So um, 1798 has a big impact on Kilmainham. So Kilmainham, it's, I suppose it's its day job is it's the county jail for, for Dublin. Uh, but it, almost from the beginning, from 1796, um, it's used also as a kind of a political prison or a state prison. So among the first prisoners is Henry Joy McCracken in 1796. Um, and they, they released him, which turns out to be, I suppose, a mistake on behalf of the establishment. Um, but uh, in 1798, one of the uh, most amazing bits of kind of physical evidence that we have is an inscription on the windowsill uh, of one of the uh, rooms of the jail um, by a guy called Patrick McCann, who was an apothecary. Um, and uh, he was originally from County Down, but had a business on Capel Street. Uh, he was eventually re released. There's kind of a deal done uh, with the French under the Treaty of Amiens and the United Irishmen are released. Uh, and he's released on condition that he uh, exiles himself to France uh, and he settles there, but later joins Napoleon's army uh, and is killed um, uh, following the siege of Flushing. And that leaves his wife. And at the time, she has two small children and a baby. Um, destitute when she goes to Paris. Uh, and there she's found by an Irish priest who kind of takes her in uh, and she and the, the baby die. Um, but it leaves these two orphans. And William Lawless writes to Napoleon's uh, war office um, him for a pension for these two children, uh, and they, which uh, they are granted. They're granted a pension until they're 18. Um, so it's kind of interesting again. You know, I, I had no idea that William Lawless had this kind of connection with here. And it's funny when I was reading the book, I said, God, there's a lot of seven United Irishmen involved in the arts CSI. And then the more you think about it, of course, it makes sense because, you know, if you look at the leadership of this organization, they're exactly the kind of people who are involved in the arts CSI. They're, you know, the, the brightest, you know, ambitious uh, young men who are probably feeling, I think, slightly smothered by a, a society in which power rests with an aristocratic elite. And that, that's compounded in Ireland because real power lies with an administration which is appointed by London effectively. Uh, and I think they fundamentally see that um, that uh, Ireland needs not just reform, but actually revolution, that the whole structure needs to be upended. Yeah. Um, so like if you look at people like Thomas Addis Emmett, who grew up next door, um, 
or Henry Joy McCracken or, um, you know, Oliver Bond. These are all people from that class, you know, the kind of the, from the professions, ambitious people who uh, I think are growing tired of this kind of very corrupt um, ruling system under which they have to operate. Yeah, and I think it's no surprise. I mean, you mentioned Thomas Addis Emmett, yeah. but Robert Emmett's father was a state physician. Again, there's that sort of free medical thinking coinciding with a sort of political uh, freedom fighting, as it, yeah. as it were. Uh, you mentioned Napoleon. We have a lot to thank Napoleon for in our CSI. Um, our CSI does very well out of the Napoleonic Wars. There's no question about it. Um, the, the the populations of the prisons do a strange thing in the wars, though. Yeah. So um, uh, it, it's really interesting. Prison the the prison reformers say that they they will be able to control the prison numbers. That if they uh, if you introduce these reform prisons, they will fix the problem of crime and numbers will go down. When in fact it's always external factors that affect prison numbers. So when um, the Napoleonic, War, Napoleonic Wars break out, there's a dip in prisoners because the young men who are the main source of crime then and now, uh, to be honest, uh, they head off to the war and crime goes down. But then when um, the war is over and they return, then you get an increase in crime because suddenly you have all these young men um, who have had some fairly uh, horrific experience in battle arrive back into the country. Um, and there's a kind of surplus of young men and that causes a rise in crime. And it, like it's really interesting. after the famine, for example, in the 1850s, uh, the inspector generals predict that there's going to be a fall in the 1850s because the Crimean War breaks out. Uh, they said male uh, numbers will go down, but they predict, I think more or less kind of rightly, that there may be an increase in women uh, prisoners because the dependents of soldiers then are left um, uh, without anyone to support them. Um, so you, you get this kind of uh, correlating increase um, uh, among women, but like war has a huge effect on on prison numbers. And war has a huge effect on how medicine and surgery are both taught and dealt with. And um, the the other interest when you talk about the famine, the population that, uh, before the famine, we think it's what about eight point five million, and it it drops to less than half that, say fifty years mm -hmm. later. I think I think Ireland is probably the only country in Western Europe that has a smaller population at the end of the nineteenth century than it does at the beginning. But it's we know some of those numbers thanks to uh, medical people, including a fellow of RCSI, William Wilde, who went out and did and did the counting, um, and he went to the, to prisons and workhouses and he did the stats. And it's it's really interesting to see them monitoring those questions. But also other RCSI people, um, William Cusack, who was a president along with William Stokes, they were looking at. What happened to so we know what happened largely to the medical to the to the general populace during the famine yes there was hunger but actually what killed people in the very great extent was the attendant disease that went that went with it but it was medical practitioners were also suffering in huge numbers too uh, and cusack and stokes estimated that maybe something between one in 15 one in 14 one in 15 uh, of those frontline medical workers died to themselves and much greater numbers actually got sick and were out, you know, were unable to work for a long time. And so their families suffered as a consequence of that too. And you get the same two men, Cusack and Stokes, writing to the British government saying, we actually need to look after medical practitioners and their families when they get sick. Because the point they were making was that from the time they qualify right to the, their retirement, they are at the front line of encountering illness on, on a very regular basis. It's interesting to watch these sort of even, even um, as there are large sort of uh, experiments and new new thinking. So something like anesthesia comes in almost exactly the same period, 1846. I'm always inclined to point to the window up here in case you ever have to do an exam in, in, this, in this room. Uh, that's October 1846 in Boston. On the 1st of January 1847, the, the same technique is, is, is tried out in Dublin. Um, and one of the things when I was writing the book about that, I found it really fascinating that that thinking moves so very quickly. Uh, it goes from Boston to London to Dublin super fast. Um, and that's as a consequence of medical journals and letters flying here, there and everywhere. One of the things I was really interested in discovering or trying to find out when I wrote that little particular section was who was the person who was subject to that experimentation. So it was an 18 year old girl called Mary Kane. Um, 
and because we know we know John McDonnell really quite well and um, his portrait of him upstairs. But Mary Kane is the other name that kind of gets written out. And I wanted to restore those names. So one of the things I was going to put to you is um, there are in, in the era the class who do experiments and then the class who are experimented upon. And I'm wondering if that, to what extent that applies in the prison population as well. Yeah, uh, they're, they're, um, the first half of the 19th century is a period of huge experimentation when it comes to prisons. Um, so one of the interesting things about Kilmainham is when it's built in 1796, it's very much seen as cutting edge, the ultimate in uh, uh, prison architecture and the grand jury are bringing people to show visitors to the city. They're bringing them out to come in and show them just what a go ahead place uh, Dublin is. By the 1820s, when they set up the inspector generals of prisons, uh, they are lamenting the fact that Camaynham Jail as the county uh, jail for Dublin is so old fashioned. And really, you should be building a new radial prison um, because the whole idea about prison reform has moved on so much. Uh, in that time, and there's a whole new design for prisons that have to be introduced. Luckily, uh, for the grand jury, they kind of dragged their heels on this uh, because that de design that's popular in the 1820s and 1830s is superseded um, in the 1840s. Um, I looked at, um, because I grew up outside uh, Nace, so I was looking at Nace Jail, and they did uh, they did modernise their prison, uh, I think, around the 18, kind of late 1830s. And they've pretty much just completed it. And then the uh, inspector generals uh, in there in a few years later are saying, so that's great, the work that you've done there. But actually, we have a whole new idea and you need a whole new jail now. Um, uh, so there's Curric all this curriculum. Kind of, before. Yeah. And they introduced this idea of it's it develops in America. And it, it develops out of kind of Quaker thought uh, about uh, silence and separation, about isolating prisoners for much of their time in prison. And in the silence of their cell, they can contemplate their evil deeds and see their their ways, and they will be visited by the the chaplain of of their own denomination. Uh, so again, it's interesting that like it's um, the prison system is multi denominational uh, from the very beginning. Um, so they they do all this, and nobody, from what I can see, thinks what effect is this having on prisoners themselves, and you don't get um, very much feedback as well about what prisoners made of these conditions. Uh, and you mentioned William Wilde, and actually one of the, for me, one of the most useful primary sources as to what it's like to be in a Victorian prison is Oscar Wilde and the Ballad of Reading Jail, where he talks about the contrast between outwardly they these uh, prisoners look kind of docile and uh, obedient and disciplined. And he says, but inside the they are raging. There's this is kind of fires raging inside them and he uh, writes as well that like one of the worst things that happens to prisoners is the absence of any human contact or any human warmth. Um, but nobody knows or seems to care because prisoners are there to be experimented on. Yeah. Um, and nobody really cares about what this might be doing to them. Um, and it's only through people like Wilde or people who even actually Parnell as well, he gets because he's in Kamenum jail for a number of months, they start to kind of get some kind of sense about what it might be like to be in a prison and yeah. uh, what this might be doing to people. Yeah, it, it's so interesting because these are the people who kind of give the lie to the, the sanitized, literally the yeah. sanitized version of what contemporary society is. So the people who see that are the prisoners and their jailers. But the other people who see that are the medics who are who are going from place to place and seeing. I mean, I'm thinking I'm moving towards the whole question of we're talking about public health medicine yeah. and uh, the first chair of public health medicine 1841 that was in first one in Ireland was RCSI Michael Henry Molson but the, the the other figure who occupies that chair later on is Charles Cameron and he's the person who goes around seeing what you might call the underbelly on a regular basis and making constant rep reports on it uh, it is his life's work to to say you know all is not well and uh, even going back further you have figures like Collis, very interested in, in syphilis. This is the, the underbelly, which is not spoken of in polite society. But if you're a medic, you, you absolutely can't avoid it, nor can you. But but equally, um, if, if you're in the prison system, like certainly as a, an inmate, it's very hard to escape that. Yeah, no, like we were saying, I think to uh, to treat an illness, you have to name it. And to punish a crime, you also have to name it. So all these things that can't be spoken about in wider society, 
have to be addressed um, in the prison system and I think also in the, in the medical system. Uh, and like I was very interested in Cameron is looking at kind of issues around kind of venereal disease, which is a real, real, real problem in Ireland. But you wouldn't get a sense of that, I think, from newspapers and, you know, and polite descriptions of life in the city. And one of the uh, things that is almost unique to Ireland is the amount of female criminality in the mid 19th century. Um, one of the problems that poor uh, women face in Ireland is the lack of economic opportunity. So in the United Kingdom, you have, or sorry, in like um, England and, and Scotland and Wales, you have the Industrial Revolution, which is providing work for, for poor women with limited education. In Ireland, the only, one of the main sources of work is domestic service. And to get that kind of work, you need to have what is called a, a good character. If you have any association, not just with kind of prostitution, but with prisons in general, uh, you are considered a fallen woman and there's no way you're ever going to get a job there. So what the big difference between the experience of men and women in the prison system in the 19th century is what happens to them when they leave the prison, because there's literally nothing for them. And uh, with women, you get kind of offending and reoffending again and again and again. So one of the things that we can do now, since they've digitized the prisoner and kind of trace a woman, if she has an unusual name, um, you can trace her over a period of years. So there was uh, a woman called Bedelia Farrell, brilliant, unusual name. And um, we were able in the 18, kind of 40s and 1950s kind of trace her career. And, you know, there's a, a real pattern to it. So there's lots of arrests for loitering. The crime was loitering or, um, you know, uh, disrupting the public peace or loitering with the intent to commit prostitution. But that's just a detail. It's not the prostitution that they're, she's being arrested for, because that's pretty much not a crime. It's the loitering. Um, it's assault, uh, occasional. There's, there's a big issue around uh, alcohol abuse. Uh, so there's a lot of arrests for, for women um, uh, and drunkenness. So over the course of just a few years, she's we found kind of 50 different prison sentences in Kilmainham and in Grange Gorman. Grange Gorman is the first female only prison in uh, Great Britain and Ireland, um, which showed us was the particular nature of the crime. At one stage, nearly 50% of the prison population in Ireland uh, is female. In Kilmainham, it's over 50% on occasion. Uh, at the same time, in England and Wales, it's 25%. Now, women barely, as a percentage, you know, there's just a couple of percent of the prison population. Women don't generally end up um, in jail. Um, and as I said, it's that kind of that, that this kind of cycle and in, in the midst of it all, then with a lot of these women, you'll find like uh, arrests for attempted suicide as well. Mm -hmm. So you get a sense of this very kind of chaotic um, life that they're living inside and outside the prison. Um, but as I said, you don't get a sense of that, I think, uh, in the newspapers at the time. Uh, you know, you, you sense that Dublin is poor but pious. Is, yeah, dear, dirty, dirty. Where something like thirty-three percent of of the inhabitants live in a single room. Yeah, um, that kind of. Thing. The other thing is to, that exact area that you're talking about is when women arrive into a place like RCSI. Like, given a tiny gap, they they really try to make. And there there were brilliant figures. And one of the most interesting things we we did in the Heritage Department in recent years was um, collaborate on the Women on Walls project, which is. I guess you're all familiar with, but to watch that and that often a lot of those women have a political edge to what they're doing and um, they want to get through and they want to bring others with them. There's always that kind of push for um, changing society as well, as well as changing their own their own lives. They're of a class who want to do that, but so but equally return to a figure like Cameron. 1913 is a really interesting year because uh, of the 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 collapse of those houses on Church Street, which is a major, Cameron goes, he says this was always going to happen. He'd been writing reports for 35 years and it more or less gets swept under the carpet. And Cameron has made a kind of scapegoat figure for that. I think we've only really begun to appreciate his efforts and rehabilitate him in recent years. And we were involved in the centenary celebrations and RCSI awards the, the Cameron Award uh, every year now. But um, Cameron's not the only person who's appalled by that uh, collapse of houses in Church Street. Yeah, um, I think it's that's one of those stories that is a huge story at the time. And I think because of subsequent events, it's kind of slightly overshadowed. I think it's overshadowed 
you know, by the lockout, but also obviously by the First World War and the 1916 Rising. But it's a really big story. And one of the people who writes about it actually is Patrick Pierce. Uh, at the time, he's he wrote a series of articles for the Irish Freedom newspaper, which is kind of a kind of a radical uh, newspaper. And he calls them from a hermitage because the house he's moved to school to in 1910 out in Raffarnham was called the Hermitage. And he kind of sets himself up. Uh, he actually plays with the fact there's there's an 18th century hermit's cave um, that was built by Edward uh, Hudson, um, the man who, who built the house back in the late. Hudson was a dentist. He was a dentist. Yeah. He was the king's dentist. And he Ireland. ended up in jail too? Uh, this is his nephew. Oh, nephew. His nephew ended up in jail. Uh, but it, Edward Hudson actually was, he used to live on Stephen's Green and he became friends with the Emmets. And that's why um, his house, the Hermitage, becomes associated with uh, Robert Emmett, because it is said that Robert Emmett used to secretly meet Sarah Curran, his sweetheart, uh, who lived across the road in the in the Priory, uh, that they used to be able to meet uh, in the grounds of St. Endas, of what's now St. Endas. Um, and that's one of the things, that's what draws Pierce there the first time he visits, is he wants to see where Robert Emmett used to walk. And there was a walk called Emmett's Walk. Uh, and he saw Emmett's Fort and ate grapes from Emmett's Vine, everything. Emmett's memory kind of clung to the whole area. Um, so Pierce is, he, he's, he's imagining himself as this kind of uh, pretend hermit. And he talks about, uh, at one stage, about the Church Street collapse. And I think for, for Pierce and for people of his generation who are being drawn into this revolutionary movement, I think the collapse of this house and also just the the dereliction and the appalling conditions in which people are living in Dublin is symp symptomatic of the failure of British rule in Ireland. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, we, we don't think enough about what it was like to grow up in a city where people are living in these kind of 18th century decaying houses that are literally falling apart. Um, and this collapse, you know, obviously Pierce writes about it, but then, you know, there's a big inquiry by the uh, ISPCC and those darkest Dublin, those images of the tenements that we've all become familiar with are based on a man going around and actually photographing uh, and they appear in, in, in the book. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and it, I think, as I said, it does get overshadowed and the need for public housing gets overshadowed first by the First World War, then by the rising in the War of Independence and, and the Civil War. And interestingly, you only start to see, I think, major initiatives around public housing then in 1922, um, where you start to see the building of good sanitary public housing um, um, by the authorities um, uh, kind of in the around the city centre, yeah. the kind of tenters area. Which but is architecture as public health medicine, if nothing else. Yeah. Um, and it's really interesting. I think when Pierce writes about those things, one of his responses is, well, we'll go have a revolution. If you want to know more about Pierce, and I thought I knew something about Pierce insofar as I grew up with him and there's a picture in the school and so forth, but actually, uh, Brian has written a great book on, on Pierce and it's he he allows in, into this account of Pierce's life the happenstance of history, the, the other directions where things might have happened. Like Pierce tried a bunch of things as a, before he could have said, well, I, maybe Revel will be what, will, yeah. what I do. Yeah. You know? And he was only he was only 36 when he was executed. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. Yeah. But his particular reaction sends him in one direction. And Cameron had been writing about the, that, those same conditions. But Cameron was so much older and I guess a, a tired figure. Yeah. Uh, we're circling ever closer to 1916. And I yeah. think we should spend a little bit of time on that. Definitely. I'll watch the clock. Obviously, um, RCSI is thrilled to be at the centre of the <laughs> national narrative. But this was not always the case. When I went back looking at um, previous histories of the college, so the, the Cameron does, does his version. The second edition comes out in 1916, just a bit too late. He's kind of beaten to the punch by history. So 1916 does not appear in his 1916 edition. It's just unfortunate timing. But would it have appeared? I don't know if it would. He was very much a loyalist figure. That's a very great difference between him and Pierce. So in 1949, the professor of biology, uh, Wittes, produces a history of the college. 1916 is not in it. When he does a reissue in the 60s, the late 60s, I think it's 1967. So at this time, we've all got time to get used to the idea. So 1966 is a big, big year. And so Wittes um, includes um, an appendix on 1916 in the college. And we all know what 
surgeons do to appendices. <laughs> so it's not exactly in a very secure location. But actually, when I when I came to to write about it, I I just I just kind of loved it and I reveled in it. And it's the single longest chapter, so um, it's great fun. We can walk through the spaces. Uh, I showed Brian that bu bullet hole earlier. Uh, Brian made the comment that Albert survives quite well here. Um, but Queen Victoria, whose portrait was upstairs, does not survive quite so well. Um, but one of the really interesting and fun figures, from fun is probably not the word, is Margaret Skinner. So I was showing Brian the room upstairs where the rebels had their first aid station and where they slept. And the reason they were in there is they were safe. It has the dummy windows, the three dummy windows that face onto Stephen's green. Um, um, but um, one of the rebels, a woman called Margaret Skinner, who's a Glasgow born school teacher, she said the, the authorities may as well have been firing pea shooters at the front porch for all the damage they did. I love that image and I, I use it in the book and I use it every chance I get. And we can still see the marks of it, though I know the uh, states team are looking after some of those. I'm sure they filled them in. <laughs> um, but but Skinner has a whole other life that I never got to pursue. Um, yeah, so uh, like she's a really interesting character, and it kind of comes back to what you're saying about I suppose that the medical profession provides this kind of craft through which women seem to be able to kind of forge um, a way at the end of the um, the 19th and early 20th century. And Margaret Skinner is her our, her parents are Irish, but she actually grows up in Coatbridge outside Glasgow, which is apparently a very different place than Glasgow, as people on social media constantly have pointed out to me. Uh, their Coatbridge people are very proud of her. Uh, but she comes over to Ireland um, and becomes involved first with the Irish Citizens Army, which are founded in the wake of the 1913 lockout. Um, and the Citizens Army as a socialist organisation is a lot more egalitarian. So I think it's no coincidence that women, the more prominent women in the 1916 Rising or the women who get to more play more prominent roles come from the Citizens Army, people like Markovich, Kathleen Lynn, another medical yeah. person, and uh, um, Margaret Skinner. Uh, she's a really good shot as well. Um, and she has this great story. She comes over and uh, she is taken under the wing of, of Countess Markovich. And Mark, which is in charge of, of the Fiona, the, the boys uh, movement, and she dresses up as a boy and goes to uh, uh, this shooting range that they've set up. And they're all amazed at this boy from Glasgow who's so amazing as a shot. And then she does the big reveal and reveals that she's a she, she's a woman and uh, they're all kind of shocked, but you know, respectful, I think, of her abilities. Um, so it's no coincidence that she ends up on the roof uh, of the College of Surgeons in uh, 1916. Uh, she's badly wounded and um, is, I think, she initially treated down in, in Vincent's uh, across the park. Um, but uh, she writes a kind of a kind of a propaganda memoir called Doing My Bit for Ireland and goes on a uh, lecture tour of the United States to drum up support uh, for the revolutionary movement. And there she meets uh, a woman from Tipperary called Nora O'Keefe. And when they come back, they move in together and they live for, together for the rest of their lives, initially in Fairview on Waverley Avenue, and then they move to Clontarf. Um, during the Civil War, both of them are imprisoned. Uh, they're both on the Republican anti-treaty side. Uh, Nora Keefe actually is in Kilmainham um, and Margaret is uh, in Mount Joy and then I think in uh, the North Dublin Union. Um, but she works as a national school teacher but ends up being president of the INTO um, and represents Ireland uh, uh, at kind of international conferences. So there's kind of pictures of her like in the Philippines speaking at conferences. So she has this kind of amazing career then in education and the the, the labor movement. Uh, but one of my favorite thing about, I suppose, about the relationship between these uh, two women is on St. Patrick's Day, so it's kind of timely, uh, when Margaret Skinner is in Mountjoy, she signs the autograph book of a woman called Jenny Coyle. Uh, Later, Jenny Coyle is transferred to Kilmainham, and in August of that year, she's a prisoner alongside um, Nora O'Keefe. And Nora O'Keefe finds Margaret's signature and squeezes her own signature in at the side of this autograph book, which is not a thing people, women do in these, these books. Usually they just find a new page. And in terms of their relationship, I think it's, for me, it was really touching. And we find it with the help of Mary McAuliffe, who's Margaret Skinner's biographer. Um, 
because you know these kind of little indications of the nature of 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 their their life and partnership together. Um, but you know it's, it's it's again it's really interesting that you know that as I said that the the rising certainly in the initial period because it's a new and revolutionary organization there's a lot more opportunities for women um i think you can see that those opportunities being shut down subsequently as a as uh things become a bit more institutionalized but definitely in those early years there's a lot more yeah opportunities for the, them. the glass ceiling is is pretty yeah. solid and um, the, the the rebels who come into the college hold out here longer than anyone else and it's it's uh it's nurse o'farrell who, who brings the surrender the next day so pierce has surrendered in, in the in the gpo on the saturday it's not until the sunday that nurse o'farrell arrives in news and just outside there's a, a brand new bust just just on the end of 2022 um of nurse o'farrell uh, by the artist john rainey it's part of two Florence nightingale and john Rainey and uh nurse o'farrell it's very much well worth a look but i know we're going to maybe step out there for some refreshments briefly and as the rebels held out slightly longer than anyone else we have held out really quite well we do have another 100 years to go so we might have to pick this conversation up a lot another time but i love the way that we can have context within context and stories within stories and the back stories of other stories and then the the aftermath stories that i didn't really get to tell in the book so i've, I've had a great time